So my name is Jason Rowe. I'm here today with InspiredStartups.com to interview Niall Harbison, uh, from formerly from Simply Zesty, now PR Slides. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about some of the stuff that he's doing. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about your book. Cool. Um, and uh, do you want to introduce yourself, maybe? Yeah, I've, I mean, I think you did a good job there, but it's, yeah, I do, do a load of stuff like PR slides and Love in Dublin at the moment, and I've just written a book called Get Shit Done. Very good, very good. Okay, so maybe we'll, we'll kick off with um, maybe some questions about the earlier days. Yep. Um, of, you know, kind of, I, I think the first time I met you was probably after Dragon's Den. Yeah. Kind of pitch thing that had happened. Yeah. Um, maybe, do you want to talk a little bit about iFoods? Uh, and maybe uh, about the, that pitch and how it went with Dragon's Den. So. Yeah, so I think that was in 2007, I think, around that stage. Um, I think I met you at maybe a meetup or something, but uh, and we were trying to raise money and not doing a great job of it. Uh, we'd spent most of our own money, so we were like, okay, let's go in the Dragon's Den. That's a great place to get money. So Sean, who's business partner... Uh, applied and we got accepted and we went on and we didn't actually get the money we but they really liked us i know everybody probably says that but it was quite a good reaction uh because we had an issue with the name being the same as a competitor but off the back of being on that then we went and raised money so it was a great platform to to put the business out there okay and in terms of the dragon's den just uh, in itself as a platform do, do, do you have any kind of advice or tips for people like you know because i know a lot of people say it's actually less about the first showing and it's all about the repeats and the, you know, did yeah. you see any of that? I don't know if, if there'd be enough value of doing it in Ireland. I think it feels quite small, but we did it in the UK, which was, I think there was like 7 million people viewed it. Okay. And even like we had our servers and everything ready to deal with the traffic and still that was a disaster. We weren't even close to being able to stay up. Um, and yeah, the repeats and stuff like that on Dave and stuff would continuously bring in traffic. So it was... You, the problem is you get a lot of messers. So you get 95% of emails and you get hundreds of emails are just messers. People yeah. pretending to invest and all sorts. But then you get some very serious investors as well. So it's great for exposure. If you can do it, do it, I would say, definitely. Okay. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say anything bad about it. And the feedback you got on the day, you know, there was a lot of, uh, I, I guess a lot of focus was put on the name and the decision on the name, and you then later went on to, to rebrand and to, to relaunch the site. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, we, the problem was it was called iFoods, and then we didn't know we should have researched it, but we were stupid. There was a iFood without an S, exactly, doing exactly the same thing, so it was, that was a big problem, um, for the investors, and they, I think we lost credibility with them, because they, they were all, it's actually a, a four hour, or no, it was about three hours we were filming, and they edited it down to four minutes, so it was all about the name, but on the day there was lots of discussions, but I guess they need to make a story out of it, so, mm. uh, we didn't get the money, but they were very complimentary. Okay. And you see, so you went on to raise money afterwards. What, what kind of, what type of investor did you go for? It was, uh, an angel it was, was it? a bit of, a mixture of angels and Enterprise Ireland and a bit of our own money. And so there was about 500 grand com, com, combined. Uh, and the Dragon's Den really helped that because it just sort of made us more credible and got us out, helped our traffic and just brought loads more people to the site. So it was off the back of that that we, we raised it. Okay, and, and just to, in terms of the the growth piece, you know that that you're kind of talking about uh, at, at the earlier stage. Obviously, if you're starting from a small uh, small base and you're trying to grow something and raise awareness of, of a product or service, uh, you know how how like in today's I know times are different a little bit, but what would you suggest for people to do nowadays in the same way? I don't know. Every business we've done, like I've never had much marketing budget, but social media and a blog. I know that sounds pretty obvious that's mm. where everybody starts these days but they're they're brilliant like there's no better way of getting your message out there as long as you create interesting content and you're not just sharing links saying come and download my app or come and mm. enter my competition or whatever it is because people see that everywhere so if, as long as you're creating really good content like somebody like intercom or you know like so, so mm. a website where you keep going back to and it's interesting then you're dragging people into your service so it's not free social media, like you, you might have to pay a little bit and it takes a lot of your time. You can't just lash something up. Mm. But that's, that's where I'd be looking to grow it if you don't have much budget, which most, most startups don't. Mm. Do you think that now with, uh, I guess Facebook and Twitter, 
go into more paid media strategies. Yeah. Do, do you think that's going to be a barrier now for a lot of startups using those channels? It or is. Will it go back to blogs maybe? Maybe, but it is and it isn't because, yes, it might be paid. Like the, You're right, there's no more free distribution. Right? There's a bit if you're really lucky, but it's mostly paid. Um, but w- if you spend 100 euros, you can still reach... 100 accountants or do you know like it is so targeted that if you've got a if you want to hit people in Galway or uh Paris or wherever it is you can advertise to them so your money goes a long way whereas before startups would have had to pay 500 quid for a page in a magazine that nobody sees so yeah, yeah. It, it, it's still useful definitely and in terms of measurements and how that's changing uh, I, I know like there's a lot of startups are obsessed by by those early stage metrics when do you think that becomes more important? Is it is it the early days, or is it when you're just hitting that kind of? I don't know. You I found don't. Something that worked, you know. The one that we always measure now is sales. So it's uh, you can have nice users and, and stuff like that. But I was reading an article yesterday saying you know a startup in the states wouldn't get funded with ten million users now. Mm. So like it's it's changing. Whereas if you walk into investors and you show sales, even if it's one thousand euros this month and two thousand euros next month. That gets investors excited. Do you know what I mean? So I, I would always focus on the sales rather than other metrics. But um, yeah, sales. Okay. It, it just it, in terms of if, if people are trying to get funded, I think it's a really it's what investors look for. You know. Okay. Cool. Okay, cool. Well, let's let's talk about maybe um, a little bit about Simply Zesty, um, and in terms of um, the early stages of growing. Uh, not just an agency, but a team. Um, at the early stages, when you were you were kind of looking for people and talent, what what were the kind of things or characteristics of people that you'd be kind of keeping an eye out for? I think in startups, it it does attract a very specific crowd. You know, like a lot of people who are into startups are um, maybe not less focused, but it's a little bit they're good at getting shit done and mm. and jumping around so you need a very different team at the start to when you get to 10 or 20 people you need people then who are good at process and spreadsheets and you know like client management mm. and doing all the not boring stuff but the, the the stuff that make companies successful but in the early days you need like scrappers and people who can work till midnight and people who'll just get the app built or mm. you know like who are not precious about you know not having an office or you know like you really need people who are just willing to get stuck in in the, in the early days but then it, if you have 20 of those you're not going to have a great company yeah. so you need a bit of a balance uh, once it gets once it gets a little bit bigger okay and in terms of I think uh, you probably won't mind me saying I think you looked out with Lauren as a partner yeah 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 in the same way with partners and working with people uh, what would be your what would be your general kind of feeling about going about that I think it's a, a partner's great like nearly every business yeah every business I have been involved with has had a partner and I think if you can find somebody who's good at the stuff that you're not good at so if you're not good at sales or if you're not good at marketing or I'm bad at process and spreadsheets and all that and whereas Lauren was great so on the flip side she wasn't good at going in and selling herself or you know so you, you need a, a, a hopefully complementary skills because if there's two of you there and you're both techies but you're both shit at selling that you're not going to get very far you'll have a great product but nobody will ever use it so if you can if you can have a balance of people it's it's ideal okay and i think we were talking a bit about sales as a metric so at the early stages um you know trying to trying to get those early customers with that early scrappy team yeah um it, what would you know just starting out what was your approach what what kind of approach do you take to get those early customers on board um you probably have to promise really really big and because you, you don't have anything to back it up with like you've no uh, other customers or you've no testimonials or anything like that so you need to really deliver amazing work um and i think if you can if again going back to blogging or case studies if you can if you can create really good content that shows you're knowledgeable so if you're a gardener let's say if you can you know go and do a few gardens for free and and take amazing pictures and or videos or uh you know get a testimonial for somebody you, you just have to show that you're really good at your work and and if if that's through a blog or through your website um that's the way to do it and you can always make 
you can always make yourself seem a lot bigger on a website than you mm. actually are. So it's our team, even yeah. though it's me and you in a, sure. in a and our laptops in a cafe, you know, yeah. or if it's, uh, if you go and get some professional photos taken or what, whatever it is to make yourself seem more established and bigger because people like doing business with companies that have been around and are trustworthy. Mm. And so, so you're going to have to spoof a little bit that you're bigger than you are. Okay. And in terms of trust then, so, you're trying to build a bit of rapport. You're trying to build trust. Obviously, you know you have a bit of a scrappy team. Yeah. Do you think Irish companies, Irish startups, have a bit of a, an issue with going out outside of their comfort zone in that area? I'd say so. Yeah. I mean, it's not it's not easy to do, but like you do like if you're if you're talking like uh, say you've got an app and you want to get into Dublin City Council or you want to get into Falch Ireland or a, you know, a big bank or whatever it is, they're not going to do business with you if they know it's you and somebody else in a room because they're big corporates and they're risk averse and they've got processes and they like things ticked off and you might have the nicest swipey CSS or whatever it is, sure. you're shiny and you're happy with it. They don't care. They, they want to see that, you know, there's processes and that you're not going to go out of business because if you go out of business in six weeks' time, they're going to go and have to go through a whole new process to find somebody else. So, not spoofing, but like really presenting a big unified front that you're a big company is very important in the early days. Mm. And what would your be? Uh, I guess what would your advice be? So around that kind of sales, maybe the first salesperson or that first person that replaces you yeah. in the process. You know, you've kind of worked out the clients are now. You're you're trying to yeah. You know, I think fly. it's I I still can't figure it out. It's okay. really really hard to find salespeople. Nobody will ever sell it as well as you yourself sure. because you're passionate about it. You are people who have a part in the business, but. They're very, very hard to find and, and usually very expensive is what I'd say if you want to find really good salespeople. Um, never go with like getting people on commission and working for free and all that mm. sort of stuff. It just, I, I've tried it to myself and yeah. it just doesn't work. Um, so I, first and foremost, like keep trying selling it yourself, but then yeah, find the, the first person. Yeah. You'll have to pay for them. I'd say, okay. but they're usually worth it if you, if you find the right person. And, and do you think, um, if you do find that person, do you, do you try and develop people within your own team to work with them yeah. to learn those skills or like? Definitely, I, do, I, I think some people are suited to sales, and you can you can find them within your own team as long as they're passionate. Like people buy passion, so mm. if, if you come in and it's an app or whatever it is, but you're selling it really passionately, that's that's actually nearly more important than the product itself. Like mm. people still buy off other people mostly, you know. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about. Um, so, the, so you you ended up with Cynthia as you grew a company, it's quite successful, got the kind of clients on board, all that kind of stuff, and eventually you, you kind of got to a point where you felt the business was ready, maybe to, to sell. Yeah. Uh, and maybe maybe talk a little bit about that the the initial process on the decision to sell. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll kind of talk about uh, you know the the implications of yep. that decision made. So there was like. Th- three four maybe five people who were interested in buying it at a certain stage that we knew because social media was quite new and they all wanted to get in on the action so we were quite attractive to them and um, and we decided pretty quickly to sell it to be honest we were just like we'd had three really hard years work we were could have maybe grown it a lot bigger but i think we we're just uh, you need everybody to be in the right place to sell and we all wanted to so it, it suited us um and then we sold it to UTV, which was quite a long process, and it always is with sales or raising money. I think it was like a good five, six months from start, from the first day till the day you actually get the money. So um, that's very stressful, and it goes on for a long time. But it was, um, yeah, a, a good experience all in all. Okay. And in terms of the profile of the buyers, were, were they all media companies interested in getting into the space, or... Yeah, or other agencies, okay. or people maybe wanting to come into Ireland. So, okay. so a, a real mixture, but mostly media type companies. Yeah. Okay. Because there's been a couple of agencies sold uh, in Dublin, you know, in the last kind of couple of years. Yeah. You know, uh, maybe Interactive Return was one a couple yeah, of years yeah, ago yeah. that sold. They were quite big. Um, do you, Do you think there's a market there still for for acquisition of agencies? Yeah, probably. I think. I mean, I don't know too much about it, but what seems to happen with agencies is the bigger ones. As soon as anybody gets halfway decent, they just sort of suck them up and they're going up into bigger agencies. So, mm-hmm. like, it just. Um, yeah, there there probably is. I think um, 
it's a bit change in landscape because all the agencies are kind of muddled into one. It's either web or social media mm. or PR or SEO, but they're kind of all in each other's fields now and mm. because of the web's changing so much. So um, there could be a brand new type of agency maybe uh, emerge from it um, because the, the disciplines are all just so interlinked mm. and then they, the agencies don't like working with each other typically. Sure, so, sure. so um, yeah, I think there'll be plenty more acquisitions, I would imagine. Okay, cool. And I suppose in, in terms of the, uh, the, once you've made the decision to sell and you found the buyer, um, in, in terms of that, the next logical step, you know, so now you've handed off your baby to yeah, this yeah. New, new owner. Um, like, what, what would be your, your general feeling or advice to people like, because obviously it's an emotional thing to Yeah, to it definitely off. is. Even when you raise money, like we raised money in Simply Zesty and I think we gave away, I don't know, tw- say 20% of it to one group of investors. And I was like, holy shit, that's t- like part of our, you know, like we don't control that anymore. So it's raising money is not always the best thing. And then when you sell it, yeah, it's it's definitely not yours. It's it's You've taken the money. So I stayed there for about a year. And you, you, like the reason you stay is to try and sort of smooth over the process and get new people involved and all that. But I'm startups, like that's what I love. So it, it, corporate wasn't for me at all. Um, and, but some people sell their company and keep working there for a long time. But I just wanted to get my teeth back into something new again. And were you ever tempted to take, take a bit of a break? You know, yeah. maybe maybe do something else or what? Does, I was does that come true? meant to. I was like, okay. and then I invested in this company, PR Slides, um, and I was just going to be an advisor to Emma and help her grow and stuff like that. But it was just so exciting, and the opportunity was so big that I was like, shit, I'll jump in and help her full time. It just just seemed like a good thing. It just happened by accident, really. Okay, okay. Really. But I should have probably yeah so. taken some more time off. Well, there's always time. There's yeah, always yeah, time, yeah. you know. Um, all right, cool. Um, so, in terms of the, like, if you had to give one piece of advice to people, I guess you know, like a lot of people say at the start, try and try and have an ideal buyer in mind for your company, yeah. or like I know it's people say try and find the right investor, but you know, try and find the right person to sell to. Would, would do you think that's good advice at the start, and or or is it something that you don't quite know? Like the, I don't know. Go? It's like I mean, there's. Five, ten companies who could buy PR slides one day, and I know who they are now. Like you know, they're they're it's photo type companies who mm. uh, who are out there. So we have that in mind. But at the same time, you have to build a business. You can, like there's nothing to sell yet. You know, like there's a couple of couches and laptops, and mm. so like there's there's no business. So I think it's not bad to have it at the back of your head, but don't spend too much time thinking of like build the business first. That's people want to buy because. If you spend a lot of time thinking about it, you'll just, uh, you probably won't get there. You know, okay. that's, that's what I'd say. Okay. Okay. So let's maybe talk a little bit about PR slides. So how, how did you come up with the idea and, you know, in, in terms of, you know, either working with someone or investing in someone, like what, what attracted you to the idea and what, you know, what drives it? So it was actually, I was, uh, listening to Emma pitch it and she pitched the idea and I knew so I didn't actually come up with the idea myself she she had the idea and she was working on it but um it was such a good idea I just knew from the PR industry I was like that is a big problem because uh, you hear ideas all the time and ideas are ideas that it really needs somebody to drive them on whereas her idea I was like that is a huge problem and there wasn't anything there like it so I just knew it was a great thing to get involved with straight away um but people worry about the ideas too much like if you go into the pub, all of us have 10 ideas, you know, like if you look at any business, like Apple make phones, you know, like that wasn't that original, like, you know, plenty of people have been making phones. It's mm. the execution of, of how you do it. So um, I wouldn't worry too much about the idea. I'd worry more about how you mm. execute it and get it live. So, so what was different about what was being proposed in terms of the execution for PR slides? What, what made it stand out for you? Um, it was just... Well, Emma had like a load of customers, so she had seven or eight grand of so, customers. So good. Yeah, <laughs> customers. She'd built a platform, and the idea was good. So there was real traction there, and she'd done it all on her own. So it's just like, look, if I put a bit of money in here, we can speed it up, and if I help build a team, it'll hopefully grow out quicker. So she just had all the ingredients, like a passionate founder, uh, customers, and she had a product that was working. Okay, and and when you said, um, so she pitched it to you. 
Was was that in a, in a formal structured pitch? No, or it was. Just it was just a, there was like a mentoring type session thing. So it was yeah. as if it was a dragon's den type okay. thing, but it was it was just um, it wasn't a, a formal pitch. So it was she just pitched it really really well and very humble and and mm. it just came across well. Yeah. Was that like an EI style? It thing was. was. It was there... like a mentorship type thing for. Okay. I can't remember the name of it, but it was like they, they were putting them in front of investors to see if okay. if uh, they had any interest. Okay, very good. Let's go. So, in terms of um, so, so you've gone from your your first startup, you've sold all that kind of stuff. In terms of the second time around, uh, and in terms of raising money again, yeah. how, how does it differ the second time around? For <laughs> it's the first so time? easy. Okay. It's like okay. you just click your fingers and ask people because they've seen the first one and they think they're all going to get. Uh, you know, a, a ride on the second one, so it's a, a lot easier. Okay. Um, but you still have to. I, I say that like we had sales and we had graphs like this that are showing growth, mm-hmm. so that backs it up. But I think uh, definitely a lot easier. You okay. know, definitely. Okay, and in terms of, I suppose, um, for investors who are are trying to keep an eye out for those, like, like, do you think it's a it's a good metric? Like someone sold now. You know, follow up to them kind of straight away. It depends. Away, like, I'd say even like having a failure. Like, I learned probably yeah. way more in iFoods, for example. So, so American investors look for a failure as one of their metrics nearly to invest. Mm. Whereas in Ireland, failure has seemed like a bit of a no-no. You know, so I learned so much in the failure of iFoods, which is not great for people who invested in iFoods, yeah. but it was great for me and as a startup founder because. You won't make those mistakes again, hopefully. But when you were going from iFoods into Simply Zesty, did you have that fear of going out and raising money because of what happened? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, you don't, and just failing again would be would be tough. So that kind of drives you on. But um, I, like, neither business was that different. We just were quite good with the timing and Simply mm. Zesty and stuff like that. So, like, even if you've had a failure, I don't think it's. You know, don't beat yourself up about it. The okay. next one might not be, you know? Okay, that's good. So let's maybe talk a, a little bit about uh, Love and Dublin. So in terms of, um, in terms of the, the community side and the growth uh, from an early stage, maybe if you could talk through what you did starting out and what was the idea behind it yeah. that really moved I think it was just like it started off as a personal blog and for the first year it didn't really get any traction because I wasn't really doing much with it. I was writing every few weeks uh, and then I, I just wrote a couple of reviews and I, just, I was sick of reading reviews that were normal and the same language and stuff so I just started writing them as I thought them and shared them and a few people liked them. And then as I saw a bit more traction growing I was like hold on there's probably a proper business in here so I started not growth hacking, but thinking of little things that could work myself, like uh, building in Facebook buttons and Twitter buttons and fairly simple stuff, but it, the content sort of spoke for itself and it just it grew to a stage then where it got, to, I think, about 100,000 visitors and I was like, oh shit, there might be a business in here uh, mm. by, by accident. So I started adding recipes, um, just with beautiful photos and stuff like that, rather than the normal ones that were out there. Mm. And then it just just kept growing from there, really. Okay. And in terms of the content, like I know one piece is to have great content, but I know the photos is something you talked about before yeah. that really drives it on and differentiates it a little bit. Yeah, like I think most food blogs and stuff like that focus on quite small images. So, like I don't even think people read that much on Live in Dublin. They just come and flick through images and stupid little tips like we'll post them the best images at you know 10 to 12 just before lunchtime or Mm. we'll post a recipe at half five when people are leaving the office so they just get tons of sharing and and it becomes very viral if you if you tap into i think food that looks good at the right time is quite quite easy for people to share Uh, did you do anything on the ground to promote it outside of social media or anything like that because i remember going around dublin at one stage and started seeing like these stickers appearing. Oh, I don't yeah. know if that was related to you guys or if that was. It was, yeah. So Louise is kind of like brand manager. That was much later, but she came on and that was just spreading it into the real world. So yeah, just just popping stickers out there, and we'll we'll do more of that stuff because like no matter how much community you have online, I think as you know, it's very important to meet in the real world mm-hmm. because you make deeper connections with people then and. You know, like that, like we used to have community dinners, and you know, like the people who comment most or share the most photos would take them all out for dinner once a month because okay. costs, like you know, 
200 euros for a few pizzas and beer, but mm. you get a lot of goodwill then. Okay. And in terms of contributors for, you know, for content and stuff like that, it's, there's always that kind of stage where it's like, there's still the what's in it for me. Yeah. Kind of, kind of thing. Do you, do you think it's important to incentivize or, or use things like that where yeah. it's more? So sometimes like in, in the early days, we, I gave people profile and that was great because they'd get a bigger audience, but now we pay them because, you know, yeah. p- people value their time and yeah. so it's, it's good to pay people. Um, and you get better content, you get it on time, you get, you know, like it's, it's just a more professional organization. But in the early days, you don't have any money. So I made all the recipes with my phone and all the reviews were taken on my phone, but, okay. um, you do what you have to do at the start. Okay. And in terms of um, so there's there's obviously been a a lot of a lot of controversy yep. more recently yeah um, about love in Dublin in in terms of personal branding and and I guess you your con- contribution to yeah you know to content and stuff like that where where does the line tend to be drawn or where do you think the line should be drawn um, it's hard because it's it's not a normal business but it grew up like as my blog so it was like this is Niall's blog Love in Dublin and it was I was very associated with it but then it mushroomed into a business which it now has five people so I wasn't very good at it with the controversy like I was too vocal maybe and it was sort of harming the whole brand yeah, yeah. whereas I kind of need to withdraw myself and, and let the team build it it would be like the Irish Times having one person behind it going crazy and you know yeah. like it wouldn't be good for the Irish Times so yeah, I think they might have a few of those I'm not sure oh as well, as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah true yeah. Um, but no it's it's kind of it, it, like the founder and the company can be linked and so like okay. it's very good it helps it in the early days but then maybe when you get a little bit bigger to four or five people you need to bring the team to the fore do you want to maybe describe just briefly what what where the controversy stemmed from yeah, I mean, I, I wrote in a certain style and it, it, the words weren't, like I wrote words that I would hear every day on the street, like knacker and junkie and stuff like that. And that's fine to hear them and like, you know, popping up in conversations and stuff, but you shouldn't write them down on on paper or on the web. But do you honestly, do you believe that? Like, no, you know, of course I don't, but it's... No, but like, you know, like I know it's one thing to separate out a your personal and, you know, yeah, and yeah, the, and yeah. the, for commercial reasons, but... Like people should be able to say what they want to say, yeah. To, as long as like to a certain, well, that's my opinion. See, the but problem it, is like you know me from yeah. like five years, and you're reading that with, probably with a little laugh, and you know that it's yeah. not serious. Whereas some of these, the people who got annoyed were the people who were coming to it for the first time because the blog has got bigger, and they're like, "Wow, this guy's actually a not racist, but whatever you want to call sure. it." Um, so they were angry, and probably rightly so. And that's okay. why. But whereas people who knew me didn't think so um so that just shows that if the site gets bigger it becomes much more much more important than one person because i've got other people's like jobs on the line or you know livelihoods there to to worry about so um yeah you just need to be careful as you get bigger i think there's there's um there's a perception out there sometimes that you've been known to use controversy to really? to to raise <laughs> to raise awareness of things that you're doing uh, and maybe knowingly or unknowingly. I, I, people have said that to me about the book. I wish I'd been like that clever because you could have turned it into a case study about like how to raise. But it, um, genuinely, I wrote that uh, and I didn't think it would be like that. There's actually wor- way worse pieces than that that flew up into huge countries. That was like two lines in a piece. But uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. I think uh, not. Not intentionally. I've just I've been used to getting quite a lot of abuse online. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe maybe let's talk about that then. Yeah. So in terms of um, uh, let's just call them haters. Um, yeah. Like like some people say that you know you're doing something right when yeah. when people are becoming opinionated about the things that you're doing. Do you think there's a there's a balance there, or do you think it's it's hard? Like I find it really hard. Like say love in Dublin, like. I knew that we were onto something good when you had all like crazies coming into the comments, fighting with each other and calling each other names and calling me names and stuff like that. And I was like, geez, this is like, let's just get nice commenters saying nice things. But then you go on to the journal, broadsheet, like it's just full of, it's a minefield. Like it's full of people saying crazy stuff that I, uh, like I've never met any of these people saying mm. this stuff in real life, but it, like yeah. you've read the comments, they're, they're crazy talk, but, um, it does, unfortunately, as you get a bit bigger, I think it seems to bring out all the 
different opinions, shall we say. Yeah. And, and maybe just to, um, and we'll talk about your, your book later, but in terms of, um, there, there was one section in there that was kind of talking about individual haters in particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm sure, like, when you look at a mob mentality, you can kind of see people throwing things at yeah. them, stick on the wall. But I think it's different when it's a, it's more of a targeted kind of thing over time or you know something yeah. that builds up well this, like the thing is like, you, like you've had startups and there's it's not so much haters it's people who are knocking your idea down like you'll mm. you know them like when you're demoing the app and you, the person's like nodding away and but you know they're thinking like that's that's terrible and like yeah, you can yeah, t- yeah. or like people who are like you'll never raise money for yeah, that you know if you're yeah, talking yeah. to an investor they're like that's a stupid idea like yeah. you'll get that a hundred t- like a thousand times when you're a startup but you just keep need to keep just being like no 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 like this mm. i'm right i'm right because one day if the hater or whatever you want to call them says that to you you will give up and then mm. they've won you know so but what about to say say establish competitors in the same vein yeah you know so obviously that can, can become problematic with customers you know yeah. trying to acquire customers and in terms of perception of you or your brand yeah what, what would be your, your general advice about managing that I don't know. It's hard. Like you think it's only startups, but like Coke and Pepsi or yeah. British Airways and you know d- dirty tricks with Virgin mm. and like there's every like business is kind of dirty in that respect. Mm. So you kind of do need to fight your own corner, but it doesn't always have to be. I think if you're just the best, try and be the best at what you do and have the best marketing and the best team and mm. stuff like that. But I expect like I came from agencies where it's really pretty bad. Like they're sure. stabbing each other in the back all over the place. Um, but I think just do brilliant work and you'll be you'll be okay. 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 And in terms of responding to criticisms, um, so sometimes uh, it can be difficult and emotional when you're when you're responding to the criticisms. Yeah. How, how do you think? What would be your opinion on how to stay level during those times? I don't know. Like you know it from the Ryanair blogging thing, and it's yeah. you get people who like they just come in with these big statements like hang yourself that's what I had last week or like cut your balls off and put them in your mouth and all this sort of stuff so you just the problem is like 90% of people have got good points and are rational and maybe annoyed with you for saying something that you shouldn't have and you should answer them and try and so Mm. but it's the it's blocking out the 10% of genuinely Mm. angry crazy people who are saying stuff that they could never mean you know hopefully so it's hard but you just need to have a thick skin I think online do, do you find that because um, just talking about my own experience what I found was the moment I stopped talking uh, advocates or advocates whatever started speaking yeah 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 on, on your behalf yeah do, do you think that's that's an important thing to happen yeah or? my my problem is like even in the those ones a couple of weeks ago are different I always try and answer back and not argue my case but like be like look this is what I was saying and then it just there's actually no point a lot yeah, of times yeah. because it just it's it just gets into like calling each other names in the playground and it, it just escalates so then you're like jesus what did i start again you know yeah, so like yeah, you are yeah. better like answer the the ones that are like seem genuine and ignore the the not so genuine ones okay but maybe let's talk a little bit about uh about your new book yep uh getting stuff yeah stuff done yeah exactly um so in, in terms of your decision, and we've talked about it before, um, but in terms of your decision to write a book, um, what, what was the motivation behind that and uh, what, what was the process that you took to, to kind of to kick it off? I think it was like just because I read so many bad business books. They're either like really complicated and you read a chapter and then you just put them down or they were just like autobiographies about people that just like all seemed like they just sold their business overnight and it was all amazing mm-hmm. so I just wanted to write a book that was honest and true and hopefully you know you didn't need to be that smart or an entrepreneur or in business to read it it just just was easy enough to read mm. so so in terms of when you made the when you made the call that you were going to write the book and um, what like did you go to a publisher straight away or how did you go about that? so I, I met Michael who was actually a publisher uh, at an event and then I, I didn't see him for months and then I was I came up with the idea of writing the book and I was just like Jesus uh, what do you think of this Michael and I sort of pitched him and he was like oh yeah it's not bad and then I wrote a chapter and it kind of went from there so it was just it's sort of like a pitch process nearly like startup so um, yeah just lucky that he liked it and went for it Okay, and for for anyone who isn't kind of 
like if you if you were a blogger coming coming into you know used to writing, yeah. which you're going towards a, a book, yeah. So you you pitch the idea. They've kind of you've written your first chapter. Like what what's what's involved from a writer's point of view? Did, did, did it's really tough. Like I thought exactly like that. I was like, okay, it's a book. Like a blog is about two pages. So I was like, okay, the book needs to be two hundred. So that'll be like a hundred blog posts. And I was like, it'll be hard, but I'll. I'll do a hundred blog posts in a hundred days or whatever, you know, but it was way harder than that. It's probably like writing a thousand blog posts because they're all sort of intertwined and you need a store. Like it's really, really, it's way harder than I thought it would be. Okay. And did you get any, um, like, did, I know there's, there's all these kind of training courses that you can go no. on about how to, how to, how to write your memoirs. No, you know, sure. I can't even spell or I, Sure. Don't have grammar, so I did as best as I could and yeah. put it together, and it was really f- as formulaic as I could be. But then uh, Patricia, who's the editor, worked a lot on it. So um, no, I just wrote it as a stream of consciousness, and it probably reads like that as well. I'd say. Okay, very good. Um, so a lot of the the you've been getting a lot of feedback from the book. You've been getting a lot of great reviews. Um, in terms of the, there's always we talked about haters and stuff yeah. like that. There's always a little bit of criticism about, you know, about something new. Yeah. Um, the, the, there's been a general kind of piece that I've, I've been kind of hearing around how the book, how the book flows. Yep. And people have kind of, just from what I've heard and yeah, what yeah, I've been yeah, reading, yeah. they've kind of said it, it kind of, it reads a bit like a series of blog posts. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, is it, like, how, how would you respond to that? Would you, you know? Um, I think it was just, a, I'm not a writer, but B, most people I see, like lots of people bought it, and most people I see have finished it in like two, three days, mm. and I've heard that a lot. So so that tells me that it's kind of hopefully interesting and that there's stories in mm. there, but I just, I, like if you pick up any business book, it's like these big lofty lessons that like you need to do for your startup to raise money and stuff, and I don't know, I think that... Any any book that I had like that used to take me six months to finish. Like I'd be like, this is like really hard work, and I'd read a page every night. So I wanted it to be something that people could read through in a week and 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 sort of feel inspired. They're not going to go back to page thirty four and like see the lesson exactly how to raise mm. money or whatever. But hopefully they'd read it and feel more inspired. That was the, the, the like the general perception, or from not just from what I've been reading on Twitter and the likes, is it's very accessible. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, I don't know, like it's, it's trying to have like, get rid of all the flaws and stuff like that. You know, like we all have flaws, so, sure. you know, like let's not gloss it over and make it seem like it's easy to run a business because it's, it's very hard, yeah. you know? And in, in terms of the, the process with the editor, was there ever, was there ever a moment where you kind of, you felt like, you know, you, you were cre- creatively being overruled? No, not at all. Or, not at all. I mean, the stuff that's cut out is, was really interesting but that okay. you can't have that in there like okay. I, I, I would have gone totally crazy so um that's more lawyers and stuff like that than okay. than uh than editors but no it was she was brilliant and it was she, look i'm not an expert at editing and she is yeah. so I let her do her job so so maybe tell us a little bit about I can't the that we're, <laughs> we're, we're the uh, no, w- was it was it a difficult decision though like when when someone's telling you no you can't talk about those things. And obviously you want to, like you want to be able to open up. It's not, it's more like I was maybe a bit too open about other people around me okay. and stuff like friends and stuff. And, and like, even though like, let's say it's Jack and there's nobody called Jack, but let's say Jack, I was saying something about Jack and he's my best friend. I might think that it's fine that I have it in there, but sure. legally and stuff, it's, they, they could come back and say that, look, that's not fine. So I, like most of the stuff that's bad in it now is about myself and I'm sure. fine. I'm not going to sue myself. It seemed to just from from what I read, it seemed to have very little about the the, the other people around you. Like I know, you know, the Sean, from yeah, the yeah, days, yeah, yeah, you know, um, and Lauren it's, from Sigurdsson. Sean's actually still my best friend. Like the reason there's nothing in about him is like on day one he was like, I don't don't put anything in there. Okay. Like he gave me a box yeah. yeah. <laughs> like before I started writing it. So and then once I wrote it, he was like, Why is there nothing in there about me? Yeah. So he was like. In terms of the like the other kind of trends, like a lot of the books seem to be about people or relationships, you know, and I think that was a common theme yeah. throughout it. The one thing that struck me, I'm only recently married, yeah, and uh, the last couple of years, yeah, yeah. and you you were quite strong and opinionated about being young, free, and single. Do, 
Do you... it's, I don't know. It's not that it's the only way to go. It works for me because um, I just don't think anybody would put up with my lifestyle. Like, I'm going to be working till midnight tonight and up at six in the morning. So I don't, like, at the moment, it wouldn't be fair to be married to somebody in my position. I'm, I'm not capable of doing it. That doesn't mean that other people can't. Sure. I, like lots of successful entrepreneurs have families and and stuff. I just think it's an awful lot harder. Like I, I look at my friends with kids and I'm like, how the hell would I do that on top of the business? Like I'd be terrible at it. So for me, I'm just like, I'll leave it for a while longer. Okay. And I suppose that's a common, a common thing that I, I've been just talking to people about is, is around relationships and stuff. Yes. Um, it's obviously very, cause you know, you're putting everything in. Yeah. You know, you, you're spending a lot of time. You're actually committing a lot of your emotional investment into something yeah. that's outside of that. But what would be your what would be your advice to, to someone in terms of trying to trying to keep a balance? There? I don't know. I I'm not very good at it, but it's it's you just you're so involved with it emotionally, like you say, and it's all it's it's like your baby for want of a better word, and you're just you love it. But the other person, be it a wife or a partner or parents or friends or whatever like they need a bit of your time as well and you probably don't give them enough you know like yeah. you, they suffer and um it's very hard for like they you know you might think they're just watching tv or whatever it is but like that's just you know like they want to spend time with you so it's 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 hard i, I like i don't know how to how to balance it very well but yeah. uh so i'm not the person to be giving advice okay. no, it's, it's an interesting one like a lot of a lot of people I've spoken with have kind of said like it's it's the other person and and trying to to make sure early on yeah that they're they're on the same path you know? yeah uh, or they're they're aware that you're on a path and that's the way you are yeah but then how long is the path is it yeah. you know like you're promised you you're saying they're like oh I'll get funding in two years and we'll have a big team but then you don't get funding yeah. or the team gets much bigger and you need to like it, it it's just you know like business plans they they change so sure. that's it's tough okay. Cool. Um, and then lastly, the, the one thing, I guess you ended on that note where within the book, that one day when you're all done, yeah, uh, you wanted to, to set up a, a, an animal sanctuary, I think, yeah, you know? I think so. Like it's, I don't really do stuff for money. Yeah. Um, so it's, I think soon enough, maybe like three, four years time, I'd love to, uh, just quit everything and just set up a huge big, place to save animals and dogs and shit like that um yeah. which i think would make me a hundred times happier than like i'd love to have enough money to not have to work again that would be cool yeah, but yeah. uh that would be fulfilling i think in a way that business wouldn't and uh, i'm gonna ask you the odd question in terms of your not to psychoanalyze you no. your attachment to, to things like animals yeah. over 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 relationships yeah is, is it a case because some people say that you know you know, a dog will always love you, no matter. Yeah, know, that's a good. You know, that's what, a good question. You know, no matter what you do, you know they'll always kind of. It's a good question. It's okay. Well, like know? when I go and do a sixteen-hour day, and not that I'd leave them on their own, but if I ever get home, like they're still there wagging the tail, like yeah. there's no grumpy wife giving me trouble for. <laughs> for where are you? No, um, no, I don't. Like I just, I just like animals, but I also like women. <laughs> so hopefully one day I'll get married. Okay, very good. Well, let's maybe talk a little bit about. Um, about pitching. Yep. So for early stage startups, um, you know, being able to sell yourself is one thing and acquire customers, being able to sell yourself to investors or to, um, you know, even, even to, I suppose, bigger clients, it can be a little bit different. Would you have maybe any advice for, for companies at, at an earlier stage? Um, yeah, I mean, the only thing I'd say about pitching is like, you know the way you go to all these startup events and conferences and stuff and you pitch on the stage? Like, I've never seen many people get investment that way. The main way that people get investment is like little chats. So the pitch might get you in the door, but it's more the little chats that you have in a quiet corner or over a beer or a meal or whatever. That's where the actual investment happens. But in terms of tips for pitching, just like be yourself try and lose PowerPoint as much as possible, like maybe just some nice images. And again, growth stats or revenue stats, any sort of graph that's going up is, is brilliant. Um, and don't be like learning it off, you know, hours in advance, word for word, if you can just sort of, like you know your product better than anybody. So just speak about it passionately. Sure. 
Because I know, like, um, that's why I've been through some of the startup accelerators, and yeah, you know, they they have a certain methodology that they teach you yeah. how to pitch, like you know. And one of the things that normally comes out quite strong is you know scripting. Yeah, yeah. It's one thing I can't do. So no. I just I can't do it, and I, I think that's probably a challenge for a lot of founders. You know, yeah. Because you, you know, you're not an actor. No, no, exactly, no, you know, exactly, you're, exactly. You're, although you're there to present, yeah. you're, it's a different talent. Plus, like, I've been, like, on the investment side of things, and your eyes just glaze over. Like, if I see somebody coming on, like, I can nearly tell they're scripted, and they have a PowerPoint, you're just like, okay, I'm done. When's the next one? Yeah. Whereas if, if you come out and you're like, okay, here's, you know, my app, I'm really passionate about it, I'm, I'm interested, and I'm, like, listening to you engage. So I'd scrap all the script and stuff <laughs> and in terms of the audience so like i i, I think you've sat in in that kind of in that room in that line of investors yeah. uh, and on the other side as well. and on yeah, the yeah, other yeah. side like one thing I, I i often notice and maybe it's around some of the syndicates and um, when you pitch them they're they're a slightly older generation of yeah. investors uh, and you, you it's very difficult to maintain eye contact or they find it very difficult yeah yeah to, eye, remain, uh, to, to keep eye contact with you and one I just remember, particularly if you glance down a line of investors, quite often the head we'll goes keep down going one, by one by one yeah, by one by yeah, one. Yeah, like yeah. you know, like in terms of ma- like trying to manage that as a startup or like trying to deal with that. Like, yeah, what would be your? Do you, do you think that? I don't know. I, 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 what it does work is if you have some sort of demo or something okay. to keep them. Like, if you can put an iPad into their hand with a, sure. an app, or if you have sweets that you eat or like just give them something to do because yeah. like it's it's or like you know like definitely some working type of your product be it an app or yeah. uh prototype or whatever would is a great help for that I, I, one thing I, I often see is when you're pitching as well you, you'll you'll see the people in the audience who really give a shit yeah 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 and yeah, they'll, yeah. they'll make themselves blindingly clear yeah that they're interested with the head the, the head yeah, pops yeah, yeah, up yeah, yeah, yeah. and the eyes are like that and you can see their yeah, head working yeah, yeah, like yeah. you know um in terms of connecting with those people do, do you think do you think that's your main role at that point it's tricky because i'm sure you've noticed it's like sometimes those people are like time wasters so they mm. might be competitors or they might just know a lot about your business or they might want to ask you questions but they're maybe not the people you mm. you want to engage with so the one thing I'd as like a tip would be to just don't ignore any like everybody. Sometimes I've been in those rooms and you ignore everybody, and you're like, "Who's that guy in the corner? He's not even listening." And then he comes over and he's like, "Look, I wouldn't mind getting involved or investing." Mm-hmm. So it's like never write anybody off, okay. good, good or bad. Like uh, some people just have a good poker face and, and <laughs> keep their head down. Uh, one thing I, I just found with with angel investors and syndicates in particular is that uh, quite often they don't make the decisions all themselves yeah sometimes they, they'll be like a lead investor and then there'll be two or three other people who come along for the ride yeah it's it's yeah it's tricky and then you've got the yes from one person or you're pretty sure you have and then suddenly they won't answer your call so mm-hmm. like somebody in the background has said no or you know so it's until the money's in your account I wouldn't count it as an investment, you know? Like, even if somebody's telling you yes to your face, mm-hmm. it might get blocked by a bank manager or yeah, an accountant yeah. or a wife or a husband mm-hmm. or, you know, like, so, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with you. That, and it's a lot harder to get investment off a group of people, I mm-hmm. think. And do you think, um, so, so obviously the, that investment process, if, if that's the route you're going down, um, can take a, can take a while. Or it can be very quick, depending on so many different things. In terms of keeping a business alive yeah. during that period, like what, what's your general feeling about it? You lose all your focus if you're chasing money or if you're raising money or selling or whatever it is. It's, it's very distracting. So you just need to keep your targets in place. And if you have staff, keep them focused on you know revenue or growth yeah. or whatever it is. And it's... Um, because it's a lot of businesses have gone out of business by trying to raise money, you know, like it happens all the time. So I'd, I'd stay very focused on what, what you actually do yourself. And, and then don't listen to if investors, like somebody might tell you like to change a feature or do this or do that. Like don't really listen to them too much, you know, it's your product. Yeah. Like I know in, in just a minute in your book, you, you'd mentioned that, you know, you were down to a particular amount where a client hadn't paid you. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, in, in terms of managing that cash flow stuff in the early days. It's tough. Like, it really is. Yeah. Cash is king. It's the most boring or overused saying. But, like, if you've no money left, 
doors are closing, you're going out of business, you know. So um, I, I watch your cash like really, really closely and only spend it on, on you know, absolutely essential things and try and, like your startup. So try and get it in as quickly as you can. You were saying you call people like nobody's going to pay you in a hurry, you know, mm. like you, you have to hassle them just like you do for sales. So um, stay on top of it, which everybody knows, but not enough people do. And in terms of that, like it, it, we talked a lot about sales at the start and there was a chasing money mm. sometimes that's the harder job because yeah, yeah. the work's done yeah. you know and there's a cost an outlay there I don't I don't do it to okay. say fire people who are brilliant at it okay. because I'd be like oh your grants 10 days no bother yeah, you know like yeah, send yeah. it 2 weeks whatever because I don't want to upset them because I want to sell them more stuff yeah. so um there's a, last two businesses I've had somebody who does that and they're brilliant at it and some people are good at it yeah. they're just really really focused on it so get somebody who's good at it yeah and do you think that that helps if you're trying to sell in on one side but chase down the money having that second yeah, it does like just splitting it out like if you're the product evangelist or whatever you don't want to be chasing somebody for 400 euros or you sure. know like it, uh, annoying them like yeah uh, so yeah i think it really does split split it out and in terms of irish companies in particular um and in terms of getting paid do you, do you think that there's a, an over reliance on credit? Yeah, you know? Ireland's bad. Like we're doing work in the UK, and it's just like you get paid, which is like mm. amazing. Um, whereas Ireland is seems to be well, like we've come through a really bad time as well. Sure. But uh, yeah, Ireland is is I'd watch your cash tighter in Ireland mm. than anywhere else. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, I suppose just lastly, um, in, in terms of like you know those early days when you know like you were saying, so many startups end up chasing that gravy train yeah in terms of an investor coming along and enticing you into a different uh i, I just driving you down a channel like yeah i've seen it so much especially if it's a big investor yeah um like, like even sometimes like a big sale yeah yeah sometimes you can change the direction of a business yeah. with that in mind and you're saying that you shouldn't you should stick strong but if if you think you're going to get more of a return yeah it's hard to like the investors just think of you probably though i don't like if i'm working with companies but bigger investors think of you as a line on a spreadsheet or mm. an x return or whatever it is so they might not make the best decisions for the company like you you know what your vision is and your execute it might be a crap vision it might be totally wrong mm. but it's mm. your vision and stick with it uh, as long as you can because that's that's why you started the company you know okay. you didn't start it so as jack smith in whatever vc could have his little way of doing the company you sure. know sure so stick with your vision and then lastly i suppose i'm on a, a bit of a grimmer note yeah. maybe rolling back to the very start of the conversation yeah. about ifood yeah at what point you know if you've gone down that road your cash flow is tight it's, yeah. not, it's not working anymore how can the investment at what point do you call it quits? I, I stayed in iFoods way too long, like six months too long, trying to save it, trying to be a hero, you know, like coming back with, with five grand left or whatever. And I was like, okay, we're going to rebuild it from scratch. And then like, it was just, it was dead. But, um, so try, like, you'll probably know in your heart of heart mm -hmm. if it's a failure. Um, and if, if it is, you're maybe better off moving on to mm -hmm. the next thing that's positive. Like maybe it was just a bad idea or, mm -hmm. you know, um, you'll know yourself, but try and get out quicker mm -hmm. than, than don't, don't waste your time. Like admit the failure mm -hmm. to people before as quick as you can. Cause there's this perception that there's a lot of zombie startups out there. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's more than a perception, but yeah. But also that they're feeding potentially on things like, um, incubators yeah yeah and, i think it's you know, absolutely grants and all that yeah. kind of stuff like is it like who, whose responsibility do you think it is is it the uh, it's the founder yeah. themselves because it's their time and but then if people are getting grants and i don't know maybe maybe they're happy with that than getting a job but if you're really entrepreneurial and you want to take things to the next level you'll know yourself if it's working or mm. not and, and when to quit okay okay that's great Okay, so maybe let's talk a, a little bit about the qualities of of entrepreneurs and, and individuals. Um, what do you think is the most important characteristics? Like, how do you identify in you know in yourself if, if you're the right kind of person to to go down this road? Uh, I don't. It's hard in yourself because there's it's it's you know you're always going to think the best of yourself. But in other entrepreneurs, I think you just mainly determination. So if you're uh, very determined and you just you won't take no for an answer and you just keep going and going and pushing until 
it gets done. That's that's the key thing I'd look for. And you can see that in entrepreneurs a mile off. Um, and like not yeah, not taking no for an answer, especially when it comes to sales and and you know getting your product out there. So I think like the the main one for me is always determination. Okay. So if someone um, so you've done a number of investments now, in the, in the types of uh, the qualities of the people who you've invested in, yeah. What were the? Did they have all those key characteristics on day one? Yeah. D- did you just see potential? I think just like passion, they come across as passion, mm. and like they've a good idea, and then they're like they've got they've achieved quite a lot mm. already. Like they've maybe got some traction somehow by hustling or or however it is. But yeah, like if if you somebody who's coming in and not not pitching it great or just you know they don't look like they've the passion, it's it's not going to get an investment. I don't think. Okay. And would you um, would you have any kind of uh, advice, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, for for someone who is starting out, like yeah. where where should they, where should they go first, you know? So they think they have something yeah. there. They 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 maybe have that urge that they felt that feeling where, you know, I don't want to work for someone yeah. else anymore. Yeah. Um, where would you point them? I think start building it while you're working for somebody else. So, you know, sit up until two o'clock in the morning, you know, editing videos or making graphics or whatever it is you're doing. Like, just, just sit up until two. Like, you're, so what if you only sleep for six hours? Uh, you're tired tomorrow on somebody else's time. So start it like that with as little money as you can. Um, try, you know, like save a little bit of money yourself and friends and family are a good place to start. If it's a really good idea, they might invest. Um, and then um, try and get some customers. Like I know that's crazy, and like a lot of internet businesses and other businesses are like, "Oh, we'll make money in the future." But it's really good if you can make money today. You know, mm-hmm. like that's that's a that's what business is about. So um, those would be the first things. So and and then try and get something to the market really quickly. So mm-hmm. if it's an app or a video or whatever it is, like mm-hmm. just just get something that investors can look at and touch and feel because it's no good having a slide deck with you know app, potential apps or stuff like that on it so um those those things would help yeah because like the the interesting thing is like looking back so my own experience as well you make so many mistakes at the start like yeah. the, at the very start but it's almost like you you have to be doing something yeah yeah to get you to those mistakes whatever that yeah. is like some people do consultancy some people yeah. you know go out and, and hustle and sell a product yeah you know? no i know what you mean um the only thing, like, is, like, if it's your own money and you're making the mistakes, you're probably going to learn a lot quicker. Sure. So, like, if you're working for somebody else, you know, budgets or whatever mm-hmm. it is, you can, you're not that upset. Like, you're still going to go and have your pint and enjoy yourself. If it's your own thousand euros mm-hmm. that you've wasted, you'll, you'll learn the lesson pretty quickly. And, and what about working for other startups, you mm-hmm. know? Because, uh, when I was kind of starting, it, it didn't seem like there were any startups yeah, yeah, really yeah, to work true. for. Like yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. there were there were lots of businesses, that there yeah. were early stage businesses, but they weren't really there at the yeah. time. I don't know. I, I like I've never worked for a startup myself, yeah. so I don't know. But I, I I would imagine it's a good place if you were uh, early twenties or just out of college or graduated um, to to get like you know it's you can you can get up the ladder really quickly in startups because there's not that many mm-hmm. people and it's moving very fast so it's it's a good place to to learn some skills but it could be a bad startup as well you know mm-hmm. but um yeah I'd, I'd give it a go definitely okay. it's a way of dipping the toe in all right okay so this has been inspiredstartups.com uh, myself jason rowe interviewing Niall harbison um if you want to check out some of uh links today maybe now just the book really which is uh, get shit done and it's on amazon and in bookshops okay cool. everywhere. and if you want to check out uh my own projects so check out parky.com and growth hackers uh, it's an event that we run pretty much every every month next one's on uh in august uh th- i think it's 26th or 27th uh just do a bit of a google for growth hackers and you'll find it so thanks very much 